All right. So before we start, uh, you know, today we are going to continue with our discussion on network virtualization. Uh, but before we start, uh, I just want to quickly touch base on the discussion section on Friday. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, like uh, we had discussion sections, which were mostly about P4 programming. I just wanted to get, you know, feedback from you folks, you know, how many of you were able to attend those discussion sections? Were they easy to follow? Was it becoming hard to follow? You know, were things intuitive, hard? You know, like give me some feedback so that we can, you know, iterate and improve on it. Anyone of you attended it? No one showed up. <laughs> Okay. I, okay. Now we know there was one person there. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of info. Okay. Yeah. So Charles, I think there was some confusion about the timing. So from next week onward, uh, you know, like things will be correct. I think like these slots are between 11 to two. And I think like there was some confusion. The TS thought it was uh, uh, 10 to one. So, but I think like from next week onwards, things should be fine. So Kim, you're saying that there was a lot of info. So like you will need more pointers to understand what that info meant or like, you know, a lot of info was just rushed through and you couldn't follow. Because there were some useful tools uh, that the TA was talking about, uh, such as the, you know, like how to interact uh, through the Mininet uh, interface, like, you know, the shell or how to interact with uh, the runtime command. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure there was a lot more context into it, which probably, you know, you're not exposed to. Yeah, I think, like, you know, uh, one having all, like, I, I will highly encourage you folks to, you know, like run those tutorials locally, that will give you a lot more confidence working with these examples. And I think like if there are things and concepts that seem alien to you, just let us know, right? We can give you pointers on that. But I think if you want to have a takeaway at the end of this class where we have some confidence writing programs in P4, spending as much time as required to understand the basics of P4 and also like not just P4, but also understand the dev environment around uh, writing P4 programs or using P4 programs, I think that will be a valuable outcome from this class. So if there are things that we can iterate and improve on uh, so that we can provide you more context to understand all these things, just let us know. Uh, we can we can calibrate our offerings there, okay? All right, uh, any other feedback? Okay, all right, we can move on. So anybody started working on assignment one? Okay, okay. Is it easy, too easy or moderate or too difficult? Okay, good, good, that's good. All right, now let's get back to the uh, topic of today's discussion. Uh, so in last class, we were talking about NVP, which was network virtualization platform that was developed by Nisira. And that was kind of like a good uh, realization of this virtualization abstraction. And uh, the key offering that network, uh, this NVP platform was uh, aiming for was this multi-tenant data center environment or multi-application data center environment where you have different type of workloads and you're trying to offer a virtual network with, you know, like uh, control abstraction offered to these participants or applications over a physical network, right? So reuse, repurpose the existing physical infrastructure to offer uh, or support 
virtual topologies and virtual address spaces for different tenants or different applications. That was kind of like the main discussion that we had uh, last week. And we talked about, uh, yeah, last week. And we talked about the two abstractions that it is providing. One is the control abstraction. This is the abstraction that it offers to the tenants. And this abstraction basically, you know, like lets tenants control the logical network that they're working with as if it is a physical network, right? So for the for the for this client, for these clients or tenants, it doesn't matter whether the whether the network that they're programming uh, or controlling is a real network or a physical like physical network or a virtual network, right? So that is the that is the control abstraction that NVP is offering to its tenants. Or users, right? And then there is an app packet abstraction that the packet, uh, like, is getting the same treatment that it will get in a physical network, right? Like wherever, wherever it is uh, set for, right? So you have, you know, bunch of switching, routing, filtering, whatever is part of that virtual network where this packet is, you know, technically supposed to be. All those functionalities, all those services should be applied on the packet as if it's a real, if it is traversing a physical network, right? So this is the packet abstraction that is part of MVP. So we briefly started discussing the implementation, like how these goals are going to get realized. And we talked about the concept of logical forwarding uh, or, the, or the logical data path that are enabling uh, this, uh, these two abstractions, right? So hypervisor is the one that is sitting on the end host and it is the one that is implementing these abstractions or like you know the, these tenant specific logical data paths over the physical provider's physical uh, forwarding infrastructure. These logical data paths provide the appropriate control and packet abstraction to each of those tenants, right? So what are these logical data paths? Anyone wants to guess what is what is a logical data path here? So I'll, I'll skip one slide and you know, like check out this figure, right? So uh, the logical data path that we are trying to offer to a particular client here is that you know, like those two VMs are connected through these bunch of switches, right? So L2 switch, L3 router, and L2 switch, right? Now these switches, like these are not physical uh, network elements or these are not physical network devices. These are part of the virtual abstraction or virtual offering that is getting realized on this network, right? So the logical data path are basically the realizations of these, uh, you know, virtual networks that uh, that the packet is going to go through, right? So you're like, uh, basically, like as logical data path, you can think of them as sequence of match action tables that are technically going to get applied on the packet. Right. So if it was a physical network, these are the set of match action table entries that will be applied on the packet. Now, in, in a physical network, they will be applied at different locations, like you know, the, the logical data path. If this was a physical network, the logical data path one will be applied as match action table entries uh, or uh, like match action tables on L2 switch. Then the second set of logical data path two, those match action tables will be applied on L3 router and these will be applied on the L2 switch. But now we are operating on a virtual network. So all these logical data paths are expressed and you know, like are basically executed at the end host itself, right? So uh, these logical data paths are expressed and then they're compiled into set of physical match action rules or match action tables that have to be applied on the packet as part of the, the OVS that is sitting on the uh, end host switches, right? So, you know, uh, we know that the OVSs are basically sitting at the physical servers. They're providing connectivity for the VMs. And this is where we realize these logical data path into physical data path, right? And all, like data path is basically a pipeline or a sequence of match action tables that are executed or applied over the packet, right? So applying these match action tables on the on the packet that is going in and out is basically realizing the packet abstraction, right? So packet is getting all the functionalities that it will get or all the treatment that it will get in a physical network, right? So this is how they're realizing 
the packet abstraction. And now, like who's able to configure these, right? So that's that's the tenant, right? Or user of these. So they can configure these virtual tables. So these these kind of like, you know, like the logical tables or logical data paths. And they can say, like, no, you know, like this traffic has to go. Uh, you know, like via device one or path one and the other traffic has to go via path two, right? So the, that is the control program that these uh, tenants can write. And that is the uh, control abstraction that is offered to the users, right? Is this point getting clear? Okay, all right. So what would like eventually when we have this type of realization, a packet, when it is coming in, like you know, if, if we go here, right? So uh, when a packet is coming in, coming in, then uh, it is like from a particular VM, it is first going through the virtual uh, Ethernet inter or the virtual NIC that is associated with that VM to the OVS switch, right? And then OVS is basically implementing all these physical data path, which is basically the compilation or realization of these logical data paths compressed into physical match action tables, right? So all these tables are applied in sequence to the packets. And at the end of the at the end of that processing, the packet might leave the VM through the physical in, uh, interface, or it might go back to some other VM within the same host, right? So these are possibilities that will be there. And when the packet is leaving through the physical interface, suppose it is going to some other physical uh, server, then we have to apply tunneling, right? So the packet has to be encapsulated. And then the destination address will be the address of the next physical VM where or physical host where the packet has to be uh, processed. And there we, we have the, you know, like uh, destination NIC address, uh, like destination address, logical address, where the packet will eventually be forwarded to, right? We'll, we'll try to understand that with a bit more, you know, more visualization to understand how exactly that works. But this is the logical workflow of a packet, right? It is a packet which is starting from a VM and it is supposed to go to some other VM, it will go through the virtual uh, interface or virtual NIC to the OBS. OBS will apply all these logical data paths or match action table. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, it will be encapsulated and sent over this tunnel. And through these tunnels, it will reach to the other physical uh, server. And at that other physical server, it will be decapsulated and served to the appropriate VM, right? So this is kind of like the journey of a packet in this in this virtual network. Now, the the intermediate uh, logical pipeline are basically submitting packet to the first table of the network. Right? So this is this is basically you can think of that as a sequential composition, right? So you express as a as a, a tenant, you express that okay, what are the pipelines I'm going to apply. If I, if this is an L2 switch, these are the match action table I want to apply that. And then you map them together, right? So last table of uh, first pipeline, like, you know, in this case, the ACL one that will be mapped to the ACL for the next one, right? So this is how you will sequentially compose these different pipelines with each other, such that the logic, uh, this, this control logic is applied on the packet. And uh, as I was saying that, you know, at the end, there will be like if the packet has to go through some other physical server, then it has to exit through a physical NIC or the interface, network interface, right? And there it has to be encapsulated and then sent on a tunnel and it will be received by the other host, right? Now, uh, so I, I think I answered these questions like what happens when the endpoint is a VM on the same server and what happens if the endpoint is a physical network destination, right? Uh, I think I definitely answer the second one. What will happen if the endpoint is a VM on the same server? Will that packet be encapsulated or not? No, yeah, right? So suppose there are two VMs of the same tenant on the same physical server, right? And if they have to communicate with each other, there is no need to tunnel that, right? So packet from VM one will go through the OVS, whatever logical processing has to be applied, it will be applied. And at the end of the, after applying all those logical pipelines, if it turns out that it has to be sent on the second VM on the same server, then there is no need for encapsulation, right? It is, it is locally routed to this uh, other VM, right? How about VM one server one, VM two server two and VM three server one? That's a good question, yeah. So, uh, 
so if it has like so you typically don't express routing policies at the granularity of host right so like you know when you when you're engaging a particular vm you're talking about an application layer decision right so you, you like you know most of these network connections are like end to end and uh, like when you define a transport it is between two hosts right so when you say vm1 and vm2 that is these are the two hosts of a communication right so typically a communication decided that way but there might be an application where you are sending packets back and forth and if that is the case then you have to treat them as two separate instances or two separate you know like decision making which is vm1 on server 1 to vm2 server 2 and then the second is like the vm2 server 2 to vm3 server 1 right so those will be treated as two separate uh, pipelines in place did that answer your question okay perfect all right so let's try to visualize that a bit more so you know suppose these two yellow vms have to uh, interact or communicate with each other so as i was saying that you know, like uh, the packet from this vm uh, will be sent to the uh, virtual switch where we have all the physical uh, data paths or match action tables on the obs and if the pack like given that in this case it has to go through a different server then the packet will be encapsulated the packet you know like so this is the uh, the information about the virtual interface so like you know one v0110 and then uh, you know like this is the uh, like you know the virtual address for the other vm and uh, you know like so so what what is the entry that the uh, that the obs switch on this server should have what what should this switch know to make sure that packet is going to the right destination or maybe i should put it other way right if if you want traffic from this vm to go to this vm what needs to be done so let's try to break it down what will be the what will be the destination address of that packet which is leaving this first vm okay let me let let us work through this right so recall that when we are talking about this virtualization we are not just virtualizing the topology we are also virtualizing the address space right so vm these yellow vms are operating in the same address space right but it's a virtual address space okay so the traffic that is going from uh, the vm on the left to the vm at the top right uh, the source ip address will be this v0 some virtual addressing and then 110 right and then the the destination address will be v0109 okay is that is that clear now when the packet comes into this virtual switch then the destination address is v109 what the match action table entry that is required to make decision here is that if the destination is match a destination address is matching on this ip address right then it has to be encapsulated and the destination address has to be replaced with the destination address of this physical server okay so so now we have a new you know ip datagram datagram that has been created where the original packet is inside here it has the ip data it has the source address as the v01110 and destination address is v0109 but now on top of it there are these two new source addresses and uh, destination addresses that are slapped on it the the source ip address is now the source ip of this physical uh, server and the destination ip is the ip address of the physical server which is hosting the destination vm okay now this ip datagram is going to go to this physical uh, switch and now we need another entry in this switch which will say that okay if like you know first it will decapsulate the packet it will, it will extract things and it will see like okay if this is if the destination address is local which is you know 0109 then it has to be sent to a particular virtual interface network interface right and that will be the interface of the vm and then the packet will be forwarded to this vm okay is this is this journey of a packet getting clearer now
questions any questions can we move on like is this is this clear because i think like this will this this will be useful to understand how things are working to answer the next question that we are going to head to okay perfect perfect okay now tell me something about the isolation and mobility here right because that was a that was an initial goal that we discussed that we need isolation that if i am making any changes to these yellow like you know vms for this yellow tenant that should not affect my network behavior for the other vms right so say for example if i move this vm uh, from here uh, to here right so maybe i'm 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 adding this uh, you know like can you see my pointer is that visible to you folks or maybe i'm just using it locally and you can't see it okay okay perfect so i'm i'm, I'm saying that you like suppose we want to move this vm from this uh, physical server to physical server you know 1 1.2 right and now it will have two yellow vms right that is a possibility right so if we do this type of migration then what what do we really need to change what will change now if i move a particular vm from one physical server to the other what will change so only the vms or only the servers where you had these yellow vms now they need to know that this ip address the physical address corresponding physical address has changed right so you need to update some entries on all the obss across the network right but only the obss right the there is nothing that is specific to the green vms or green tenants or blue tenants here that has to be changed right so mobility is easily supported and now if i am you know like uh, like i am supporting one type of topology for the yellow ones and other type of topology for the green ones both of them are isolated from each other right like you know i don't really need to know what other tenants policy is and worry about what my policy should be given that they have a different policy in place right so i'm like there is a there is a sense of isolation in terms of how you express your control programs and there is this free mobility that you don't have to make some network wide changes because you are operating on a virtual address and you are enabling this virtual topology like you are able to support those initial goals that we had from this virtualization that we should be able to support isolation between different tenants and we should be able to support this extreme mobility okay all right now what about connecting with some physical network right so if if we want to connect to an ip address or or or, or a vm that is hosted on some other network which is you know like physically away what what will what is required for it to happen let's see what what is required so we need some type of gateway that is going to do the translation between the virtual ip addresses and physical ip addresses right so what does that mean what does that mean now let's uh, let's try to understand that uh, you know like we we are focusing on this virtual uh, red vms now here or maybe sorry blue vms the background is red so they have the ip address 171.64.74.155 right or uh yes 155 right and then it wants to go to this 160 uh, vm right so but uh, but this 160 vm is not local here then what this tunnel or like what this obs will do is that it will rather than sending to a physical server because it's not in any of the physical server locally right then it will it will be having a match action entry which will say like if you see this 160 1.160 ip address then send it to a gateway and now at the gateway we will have an entry which will direct it to a physical ip address that is corresponding to this 160 right so it might be like again this is a vm right so it might be hosted on some physical server and then you will be basically forwarding to the physical server from the gateway so there will be two type like you know there will be two changes to the uh, forwarding policy here that first from this physical server you will be encapsulating with the destination ip of the gateway 
at gateway, there will be another swap of destination IP address. And then the next IP address will be of the IP address of the physical server, which has a public IP address that is hosting this VM. Okay. So this is how we like, you know, these uh, virtual IP to destination IP gateways are the enablers of these, you know, like virtual, like hosts on the virtual network to host on the uh, physical network. Okay. So I, I think like now, like this basically ends the discussion on uh, the abstraction and how those abstractions are getting realized, right? Now we are going to switch the discussion about uh, like, like how is NVP enabling this type of control, right? Like what, what is the control infrastructure looking like here, okay? But before we do that transition questions, if you have any questions, any confusions about how, how exactly things are working here. I guess this was this was easy, right? So maybe uh, yeah, like it seems like there are not many questions here. Okay, we can move on then. All right. So now you must be wondering that uh, you're like we focused on the mechanisms of how uh, you know like a packet will traverse from uh, one VM to the other. What type of you know transformations or match action tables are required for? supporting the uh, control abstractions or the packet abstractions. But what about the control plane? What is this control plane doing here, right? So this, this is what we're going to uh, explore and understand that the, the first thing that the control plane needs to do is to extract the information from or read the state information from all these different physical servers out there, right? So, uh, you know, like uh, we will be focusing on like, you know, this, this information is available on the hypervisors from each of those VMs. It will basically, you know, extract some information about which VMs are available on which physical server. And, uh, you know, like not only the, uh, the hypervisors, but it also needs to extract or like, you know, keep track of information for the gateway. So, you know, like it will basically extract the forwarding state and uh, sorry, the local information from these gateways as well as the hypervisors. And it, like, like combined, they're referred to as the network uh, elements here. So uh, there is a question here, Ad, adding new headers will push packets over the max datagram size causing something or something like a download from the pretty much half there. Yes, so yeah, I think, you know, there are these limits uh, that uh, contain uh, like in the, that constraint how much how many bytes you can push in one single packet so that does affect uh, you like like it like it doesn't affect the data rates but yes like in a sense it does it, it like you know those data rates will be dependent on how many extra bytes you're adding as part of these headers but uh, this has been a very standard practice and i think uh, like you know gre tunnels and stuff they're supported by the hardware as well. like so I don't think you need to further break down for supporting most of these tunnels out there. Uh, they can uh, handle like, you know, these most of these network devices are capable of handling these encapsulated packets, right? If you come up with a completely new custom encapsulation technique, then maybe the size will increase enough that these switches might not be able to handle. As we were discussing, when, when you have these PISA targets, right? You can define your own custom encapsulation scheme as well. So, if your entire network is full of piece of switches, then you can handle it. But if you have a mix of some piece of switches and some non piece of switches, then it will be challenging to handle those type of encapsulated packets, right? So typically like you know, the design principle in general is to make sure that whenever you make these type of decisions, you want to make sure that you know, like uh, you, you create interfaces between the, the custom network and you know, like, like, you know, the traditional network such that the traditional network has this Apps, like you know, like basically traditional network does not know what your what unique customization you're doing in your network, right? So when I say custom network, I'm referring to these networks where you have pieces which is you're you know reconfiguring and creating new protocols and stuff. So there you apply the standard encapsulation techniques uh, before you send traffic to these conventional uh, switches. Uh, then like you know, as long as you can do that, then you know they don't care what is inside those packets. They treat everything as payload for basically. Okay. All right. So getting back here. Uh, so now the uh, the controller is basically reading the information, keeping track of what really is going on. 
and uh, once it has the information uh, then it is basically deciding that okay you know like these are different topologies that i need to support uh, and then like it makes some logical decisions about uh, how exactly the network should be configured and then we have uh, you know like this translation between the logical abstraction to the or the, the logical control plane to the physical control plane which it's referred here as like you know the network hypervisor which is then pushing the the configuration down to the obs switches on each of those servers and on gateway as the match action rules you know like it is using the open flow uh, protocol here uh, and then it is pushing them as match action tables right so something that is worth noting is that uh, the way uh, nvp was built was that they structured that what is the you know like input and what is the output and then they used this declarative language called nlog to compute the forwarding state so basically they express everything as queries and then like you know they they, they express that okay if you have these type of changes in the network then you apply some additional set of join queries and then you compute inherently you compute the forwarding state and this is again like mind you, this is all logical right so they are operating on an abstract topology they are understanding the changes like reading the changes in the network and then updating the uh, like you know the new state or the new abstract topology that has to be realized and then like that is getting translated into the physical rules uh, match action rules that get pushed to the obss across all the physical servers okay So uh, I mentioned something uh, about the uh, the physical abstraction uh, or the logical topology versus the physical configuration. So this is a bit of a uh, you know like a scalability technique that NVP embrace and which is very intuitive as well. I think like you know this like th this is what we have been talking about from the specification uh, you know abstraction uh, for virtualization right so the, the the key principle or the fundamental idea of specification abstraction is that uh, we basically are going to simplify the view of the network right and then on that simplified view you express the control programs right and then there is a virtualization layer that is responsible for translating those abstract uh, decisions into physical decisions right so uh, so this is this is basically you know like a realization of how those ideas are implemented as a real system that at the top level uh, we have the logical controllers and these logical controllers are computing the abstract forwarding state uh, for the logical data paths right so uh, you know like they they refer to it as the universal flows that they're operating on and then uh, like basically they are expressing those forwarding state for logical data paths and then we have the physical controllers that are translating these uh, logical uh, like data path into the the actual match action entries that have to be applied on the different switches right so this is basically uh, you know like in some sense the like you use like basically decoupling the decision making to some extent that if you have this one controller that is taking all these state changes as input and then computing the exact match action rule entries for each and every obs switch that is going to be computationally very very intense right so it is basically breaking down the problem and then it is first making abstract decisions on a simplified uh, topology and then it is breaking those decisions further into the uh, physical match action rule entries right is this part clear no 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 so physical controllers are not hardware this is all happening in the user space right so this is kind of like you know you can think of them as the as different processes running uh and you know like across multiple uh you know cores and threads uh and like in a way that there is a very inherent isolation between different tenants in this network so you know, like a an individual controller just has to worry about you know one type of virtual network at a time right so there is a lot of sharding that is possible like you know logical division of computation that is possible but to answer your question shortly yes like you know this is all running as a software and then uh, but but it is just providing an interface layer or like you know you, which we also refer as the virtualization layer that is translating the abstract decisions into physical decisions 
Did that answer your question? Okay. All right, so this brings us to the end of, uh, you know, like the NVP and network virtualization decision discussions that, you know, the key idea is that when we talk about network virtualization, it is basically an instantiation of this uh, specification abstraction that is highly desired when we talk about software defined networking. Uh, we saw network operating systems realizations and we talked about Onyx as an instance, and we saw that, you know, like it is exposing the physical topology to the control programs and it just gets a bit messy and uh, you know like we can't really write very efficient programs if the abstraction that we are getting is the physical network right so the control programs are heavily involved they're basically express a much low level of abstraction and then you know they, they break all the time right so the network virtualization they got a really good use case that these multi-tenant data centers were coming out they had these unique requirements and then you know like uh, basically it became a very successful use case and the nvp was a very successful product or realization uh, which was you know like commoditized and you know sold out uh, for billions of dollars <laughs> and uh, it i think like the key takeaway here is that they chose to push the programmability as much as possible to the end host right because and that is a good uh, like a very strong motivation to uh, use the obss Right, so virtual switches, you don't have to make, you don't have to create a new hardware switch to realize all these ideas, right? So, you know, like basically completely decoupled the, the programmability from the infrastructure, right? So they were still using the old dumb infrastructure, which could only understand basic, you know, like layer two switching, uh, you know, like protocols. But even with that, they were able to make all these things work, right? Now, question for you that, you know, like, what are the challenges that you see in this type of system, right? So like, do you think that this is a very sustainable model or this is how exactly things should be done or there can be improvements? What do, what do, you, th what do you folks think are the scope of improvements here? Maybe I should simplify my question. How can we make network virtualization better than MVP? Okay, so let me give some hint, right? So we have been discussing in this class again and again that the packet processing on uh, like you know, in user space is slow, right? And it's not just slow, it is, you know, like, uh, like you know, it is uh, very resource intensive as well, right? You're like, if you're processing a lot of packets in user space, then you are spending your CPU cycles processing that packet, right? So right now in this framework, uh, we rely on OBSs to, apply all those match action entries on packets right and as long as like as soon as we want this, the network to be more complex then there will be more match action table entries that have to be applied on each packet in each physical server right so now that you know like every match action rule when it is applied it's basically a lookup uh, and then there are these multiple cpu cycles that are spent on one packet one table now you are when you are increasing the number of packets or you are increasing the number of tables that have to be applied on each packet it is just adding up to the overall cpu overhead that you will entail and when we think about these big data centers cpu cycles are like you know are are a very precious resource right because they dictate your cost right so if you require more cpus then there will be fewer vms that you can run per uh, per physical server and that will just mess up your budget in general, right? So these are the things to, to think about that, okay, like, you know, this is a great idea, but what is the cost of this idea? The cost of this idea is that for this extreme flexibility, they have pushed the programmability, all the programmability to the end host, to, the, to these physical servers, but then there's a limit on how much can we push, right? As, as soon as these networks start becoming more complex, we want to apply more logical tables in the, in the, in the OBS then things are going to slow down. Uh, we are going to share, like, you know, we are going to use more and more CPU resources. That's that's not a desirable thing, 
right? So what can we do? What, what is the solution to that problem? Any suggestions? Okay. Uh, so something that we discussed uh, when we were talking about software versus hardware data targets. So we can consider using hardware data targets, right? Or data plane targets, right? Uh, but where exactly will you use them? Should I be replacing everything that is, you know, like, like should I be replacing these hardware uh, targets with programmable data plane targets? Will that help? What should, what should I do? So can we agree that using hardware targets can help address the scalability problem? Can we agree on that? Yes, okay, so, so at least we have some agreement here. Now the question is like, what what hardware targets, like what, what hardware data plane target should we be using, where we should be using them, right? Those are important questions to ask now, right? So possibilities are that maybe we can use these uh, programmable uh, network interface cards that are out there. Maybe we can, rather than using pushing all the complexity of packet processing on the OBS, maybe we can use these network interface cards and that will provide us all the flexibility, but it is still happening. Everything is happening on the hardware. Then we are not spending the CPU cycles, right? So that is one possibility. Do you folks agree? Okay. Now I, I wanted to get to this point because now you have to realize that, you know, the challenge Technologically, there was a challenge that you cannot support this, this level of flexibility and scale on a network interface card, right? When we talk about network interface cards, these are very small devices with a very small form factor, right? So push, like, you know, enabling or putting all this uh, programmability into that network interface card such that it can handle hundreds of GBPS of traffic and also, you know, like enable all these logical tables in there is, is, a, is a challenge. Right. And it took multiple years for the community to, you know, like figure out what is the right design, what are the right ingredients that we should be using for this type of chip design. And this has been a very, very active topic of research, but also from practitioners perspective, this is a, you know, like there is a, there is this race going on in the community to come up with the best solution for these programmable network interface card. Right. And this is very trending topic right now. And there are multiple, uh, you know, like successful companies that you can look up to. And like, you know, if you have to buy a stock right now, you probably want to invest in a company that is, that has a promise uh, for doing something better with these programmable network interface cards, right? So there are some companies called like Pensando and uh, Xilinx is also doing something in this area. So there are these, you know, very important players that are innovating, but you know, like where we want to be versus where we are, there is still a bit, bit of a gap, right? But I think this is something which is, you know, like another hundreds of billion dollar industry that we're talking about that is going to transform how data center networks are, you know, like programmed and, you know, like how network virtualization is supported or provided for these data centers, right? So, so these network, like keep an eye out on those programmable network interface cards because that's, they're going to define the future of data center networks, okay? But there are other options as well, right? So there are other things that we can do that maybe rather than relying on the physical network interface card, maybe we can put 
all this programmability on into a hardware target that is connecting rather than just one server we can have you know a rack of servers connected to one switch and all the programmability is in that one switch right so all these logical tables are applied in that one switch right that is also a possibility so this is where i think uh, pisa switches will and are already having a lot of traction that you know like you can offload that programmability up to these top of rack switches and then they they will enable you or like you know make tunneling decisions or applying all these logical data paths for you and that's how you can scale or reduce the cpu overhead on the local or, or on the physical servers right so the vms basically send all traffic uh, to these switches uh, and then at the switch it will be decided whether after like you know all the logical data paths will be applied and then it will be decided whether it has to go to a switch uh, sorry on a server on a different or a vm on a different server so routed on the network so it will be tunneled and sent out or it has to go back to a physical server that is different but on the same subnet right in the same rack right so it, it might get bounced back or it might go back to the same server but on a to a different vm right so all these things can happen but in a way that you know like this might still require some programmability with the ovss so ovss might still be useful but then we can simplify the amount of processing or the number of tables that we have to apply on obs and offload as many complex things as possible to the to this top of rack switch right so this is another extension another way in which we can offer the virtualization service at scale okay is this discussion are you able to follow this discussion is this making sense okay good so now you are all ready to you know do your own startup and you know offer these virtualization services now you know all the tricks and all you need to do is to figure out what are the right targets to buy and how uh, you want to configure uh, or like how you embed those new set of devices and technologies into your offerings okay so i have prepared you <laughs> all right let's move on so another topic that i want to cover as part of this virtualization discussion is about the mininet right so you folks have already used mininet for your uh, assignment 0 you will also be using or maybe not for assignment 0 assignment 1 you will be using mininet uh, the the first discussion section was in mininet so it already gave you some basic overview of what mininet is but i just wanted to give you a bit more deep dive into what mininet is and where is it coming from and how exactly you can use it okay so maybe i should let you folks answer so what is mininet so uh, some of you have already watched the video for discussion section 1 so you might know what is a mininet can anybody tell me what is a mininet no <laughs> okay virtual network what else tell me more about mininet building topology yes add some switches host so yeah i think you are getting all the nuts and bolts in place so let me try to help formulate that so it is a system that allows rapid prototyping of networks on a single server or a laptop right so you have one physical server right and there you can actually rapidly prototype a large network with multiple hosts multiple switches multiple links on a single physical server right and this type of prototyping is very very useful if you want to understand you know like you want to emulate a network and want to understand that okay if i make change x and change y what will happen in this network right so rather than trying to burn your real network you can actually create a virtual network on your server on your laptop and then play around with different set of tools and uh, solutions out there and see what is the best solution that is going to work for your network right so this is this is a very uh, interesting idea i won't say it was the only it was the first idea right like these ideas have always been out there that you know we need to create uh, some type of emulation of network such that we can test out new ideas new algorithms right so if i if i come up with a new tcp protocol right so rather than you know like making changes to each and every physical servers and then 
evaluating how it's going to operate under different type of network conditions, I can actually write a program with Mininet and express that, hey, like I want a topology with n number of hosts and I want a specific network topology in place. I want to specify what capacity each of them have and then like, you know, run this TCP on two end hosts, which are also emulated and evaluate the performance at how well, like is this TCP better than the other congestion control algorithms that are out there, like you know, this like the new algorithm that I have for congestion control is that better? You know, like can I can I prove it? Is that something that is going to generalize? Right. So these are the questions that I can answer if I have this rapid prototyping. And rapid is important, right? I can have a physical prototyping as well, but that's going to take time. And if I can create something with you know, like in a programmatic manner, and in like create something you know, in the order of few seconds, that's going to save me a lot of time, you know, prototyping and evaluating these type of network solutions, right? It leverages the lightweight virtualization mechanisms that are built in to the Linux operating system, right? And this is important to, you know, give some perspective that uh, the Linux lightweight virtualization has been there for some time. Uh, the key contribution of, you know, like the mini net was to identify that it can be used for, you know, prototyping networks, right? So. Uh, before Mininet, there were some solutions that were trying to offer something similar, but like, you know, nobody was offering this level of flexibility where you can emulate all different pieces of the network and evaluate it with as high fidelity as possible, right? And uh, <laughs> when we say this network lightweight uh, virtualization mechanism, what really is going on is that you can run processes, uh, like processes running in the network namespace. So like, you know, you can have different processes that are running in like network namespaces that are already defined, right? So this is an this is like you know the other like you know this is an within the lightweight virtualization or uh, namespace virtualization. What Mininet is using is the specific network namespace virtualization, right? So uh, it is virtualizing the network namespace or le leveraging this network namespace virtualization, and then it also uses the virtual Ethernet pairs, right? What 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 are virtual Ethernet pairs? So virtual ethernet pairs are used to enable communication between either two network namespace instances or between the network namespace and, and the host or the root namespace, right? So we will try to visualize that if you don't understand <coughs> these terms right now, it's okay. In the next slide, we will on next set of slides, we will be going a bit deep into what all this really means. But before that, I think it is important to give you a bit more background on the virtual machines because uh, you know like in the assignment zero uh, sorry in the assignment zero uh, you folks have already been exposed to virtual machines you have used virtual box right and uh, you know like it's it's a different virtualization than what this uh, mini net virtualization is right so it is kind of like important to understand that uh, how like i'm like I'm not assuming that you have taken operating systems and you know the virtualization. So I'm going to give you a very brief overview. Uh, the one that is relevant to understand the concept of network virtualization, but you know, like if you really want to understand virtualization deeply, uh, you probably want to take the operating systems class. Okay. But uh, at a very high level, uh, when we talk about virtualization, virtualization, you know, there are, it, it is virtualization of the physical resources of a particular physical server or a you know like machine, right? So what are physical resources? Uh, it can be memory, it can be CPU, uh, it can be network, right? So these are all physical resources. And uh, what VMs are doing is that it is offering a virtualized view of these resources, right? So like, you know, as, as a VM, you're basically a, a machine or, or operating system that has access to all the, like, you know, it has the abstraction that you can access all these physical resources, right? But it is a virtualized abstraction. You, when you are running as a guest operating system, you have this abstraction that, you know, you, you can't differentiate between whether the resources that you're accessing are real or physical or virtual, right? So that, that is how virtualization is enabled, right? It is enabled through hypervisors, right? So hypervisors are basically, you can think of them as managers a link that sits in between the virtual view and the physical view, right? So uh, there are two types of virtualization. One is, uh, or two types of hypervisors per se. 
one is type one hypervisor the other is type two hypervisor right so type one hypervisor is basically providing like it's it's part of the kernel itself and it is directly providing uh, you know like access to the physical resources right so it's just one layer sitting between the physical resources and the guest operating system but type two hypervisor uh, it is basically you know like providing this additional layer of host operating system and all the interaction between the you know like the guest operating system and physical hardware goes through this host operating system right so sometime it is also called hosted virtualization and this hosted virtualization or type 2 hypervisors is what you are using uh, in your assignment uh, zero right or or you will be using for this course as well that and some of you are complaining because it's too big and bulky right it is too big and bulky because it is creating its own host operating system so you know like uh, it is not very good from performance perspective right like if i am running uh, you know vms on amazon or something i might not use this hosted uh, virtualization for the fact that it is bulky and it is slow right because all the interaction happens via this host operating system and host this host operating system just becomes a bottleneck right but it is good from from prototyping perspective because it is like it is offering a uh, a host operating system and that can run like so that is not at all dependent on what operating system you are running on the physical machine right so i can on on your macbook you can provide a linux operating system for this for these vms right so that is that is something which is different and a good thing that you like you might like you know you you can run you can do these type of prototyping things on your laptop that's where it is good for it is not good for physical deployments right and in physical deployments like you know type 1 hypervisors are preferred uh because there you have control over what operating system you will run on these physical servers and kvm is a good example of type 1 hypervisor okay so with this background let's try to also understand the linux containers right so linux containers are basically you know like part of this lightweight uh, virtualization you know tools that linux has been developing over time and uh, it leverages like the, these containers basically leverage two key features of linux operating system one is the concept of control groups right so control groups are basically uh, you know like it's it's kind of like a functionality that allows us to group bunch of processes together and they basically have the same level of privileges and same you know accessibility same uh, like uh, privileges uh, like you know all these processes running in the same c groups basically share a lot of attributes with each other right and uh, it it can provide limits for the resource allocation as well right so what it means is that you can you are still operating with the you know like you are just virtualizing operating system in this case you are dividing the processes or grouping them into different c groups and you can specify that how much resources you want to allocate to these group of processes right and this is something which is very important from virtualization perspective is that like one uh, this is going to be very lightweight because i am not you know adding any additional hypervisor or something in the between i'm basically just directly like virtualizing the operating system itself right and i am just isolating different set of processes from each other and i am specifying how much resources each each these each of these group of processors processes can use right so this is the this is the feature that control group was enabling i think it was developed in early 2000 but i might be wrong maybe 2002 2003 but we can double check on that right uh and then there is the other feature which is the <coughs> namespace uh, or the kernel namespace and there are eight different types of namespaces and network namespace is just one of them right uh, it provides a restricted view of the kernel and uh, like you know the namespace virtualization can be for file systems the P like processes or pids or mounts whatever but uh, network namespace is something that is of most interest when we talk about the network virtualization here so uh, <coughs> so these linux containers i think you know there are you know like whenever anybody talks like ask you about linux containers always remember two key kernel features that it leverages control groups and namespace right and when we talk about mininet network namespace is the is the game here right and uh, like can can anyone give me an example of a container you probably have heard of containers it's it's everywhere in the mainstream news tech news <laughs> have you heard of any linux container 
has anybody worked yes docker is an example and uh, google has something which is called kubernetes and uh, i'm sure other also have similar offerings uh, the biggest advantage of uh, these linux containers is that you know, like you are not uh, like you, you don't really need uh, a separate operating system or like you you don't really need to have virtualization of like you know the entire operating system uh, in this case right so you're just isolating the the processes or applications from each other right and uh, that is very very helpful when we're trying to uh, you know like support or build these type of modular frameworks where you're running a web server or maybe a bunch of other processes on the same physical uh, physical server so rather than requiring them to run on two different operating systems they can run on the same operating system as long as you are providing some type of isolation guarantees and some guarantees on the resource utilizations right so, so th like this is a this is an extremely lightweight virtualization if on a typical physical server if you can run up to 100 vms then you can run around more than 1000 containers in that right so there is at least always an order of magnitude difference in terms of number of containers you can run on a physical server versus number of vms you can run on a physical server right so this this lightweight feature is very important and i think you know uh, like this is like there is an evolutionary cycle here uh, the operating system was the natural way of thinking about virtualization and uh, you know like virtual machines were very very popular uh, 2010 entire area or like entire era maybe 2015 virtual machines were the game but then like there was like containers were not really offering the features and functionalities that the community desired but then more and more developed like development happened in the area and then containers are off like offering really good isolation really good security properties really good resource you know uh, like decoupling properties so then containers became very very popular and docker is a very big success story that you some of you have heard of but you know like there are more success stories out there right so this is this is kind of like the story for the virtual machines linux containers now what does that has to do with mininet right so mininet was actually a very like we were kind of like figured out the value of these namespace virtualization very early right and it started reasoning that hey like you know like these are really good abstractions or uh, features that the linux kernel is offering can we use all these features to you know prototype different type of networks and that was the core idea around mininet and then the team like so this was developed uh, by a team at uh, stanford university and uh, we're like they basically just uh, like you know so so stanford university <coughs> i think is worth mentioning that you know was uh, the research group which was led mostly by nick McEwan and uh, at, at stanford and then to some extent scott shanker at berkeley so they were very proactively making developments both in the early phases of SDN with the solutions like Ethane, which was basically the first generation uh, controller or SDN use case. And then, you know, like development of POX, then OBS, and then like to some extent Onyx as well. Uh, so, you know, like, like, you know, this group was active in the very early stage of SDN. And then they were really frustrated with how exactly you're going to evaluate and prototype all these new SDN solutions, right? So, you know, like the development of Mininet was very organic that all this SDN development was going on. And then the, like, you know, the researchers realized or the practitioners realized that we need some type of rapid prototyping solution out there. So then they started tapping into this, these offerings that the Linux kernel was, was providing, which was basically the C groups, the Linux, uh, like the namespace virtualization. And then they started piecing all, like connecting all these dots together to build Mininet. <coughs> so the figure on the right is basically an overview of how we can create or what happens when we create two hosts with, uh, you know, connected through a switch uh, in Mininet, right? So when we talk about links, so links are basically the virtual Ethernet pairs, right? And this is a feature, this is a feature that is provided or offered by Linux operating system, right? So what it does is that you can connect these, uh, you can you can create something which is called virtual Ethernet, and then you can pair them together. You can you can specify that which set of virtual Ethernet interfaces should connect with each other, right? So in this case, uh, we have S1, S1 and S1, S2. So these are two, you know, like, uh, 
ethernet interfaces on the root namespace and then we have created these hosts and they have their own virtual ethernet and with virtual ethernet pair you can specify that which of them should be linked together and when you use these virtual ethernet you can also specify or you can you can connect that with this uh, uh, traffic control program that is another abstraction that linux provides where you can specify that what should be the rate at which packet should go in and out of this virtual eth pair right so then that is an emulation of a link right so you can specify the interfaces or ports and then you can specify the attributes of behavior of this connectivity between the ports right so it becomes a link right so you can specify with the tc you can specify how much latency you want to emulate right so should it be 10 milliseconds 100 milliseconds 1000 milliseconds right you can specify that you can specify the data rate so you can specify like you know whether it should support uh, 5 mbps 10 mbps 50 mbps right so note that i'm i'm using smaller numbers right because if i say 1 gbps or 10 gbps that might not be feasible depending on what type of device you have right but smaller speeds of course i can like you know we can easily support that now then uh, okay now we know that we can use these features to create links what about hosts right so if like you know if i'm running a host right why why is it important for me to run a host right because if i just create a emulated network i need to send packets to it right so to send packets i need some type of host associated with it right and that's why you know, like uh, like the 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 namespace virtualization was relevant here that you can you can create these group of like you know hosts which are in the same c group so you can specify the amount of resources that each of them can use and then you can uh, use the namespace virtualization network namespace virtualization to to isolate the these processes from each other right and then what it offers like what mininet specifically offers is that it it basically you know like creates a shell process on these uh, like hosts and then these shell processes are basically piped through a mn program right so you can use mn and then specify some control message and then that like you know that information can go down and it can you can also use it to read some information some state information from these hosts right so when you work with mininet and you say h1 and then some command then it is basically invoking this mn and then sending like you know you can say h1 ping h2 right so this is a command that you can run uh with mininet so h1 is basically telling that okay this command has to run on h1 and then uh the the ping is the is the message that will be sent to the host through this pipe and then it will run this process uh locally right so this is how host is emulated with mininet uh switches are easy basically they're just you just using obss and they're just connecting these virtual eth pairs correctly with the obss and then like you know the the top part of this figure is something that you might be able to recall we have covered that in the uh, software data plane target uh, discussion that you have the o of data path right then you have the of protocol uh, these are connected via unix socket like netlink socket right and then this of protocol is connected mm -hmm. through a you know like like this is an open flow api right southbound api and then this is controller right so you can think of controller as a network operating system right so this part of the mininet is easy you have you already know about it this part is new that the key takeaway is that there is a virtual ethernet pair here that is connecting the root namespace with the host namespaces that we are creating and then uh, in the host namespace we are running a shell process and we can interact with the shell process and we can specify whatever you know like new uh, binaries we want to run in this host through this uh, pipe that, that is running from the root namespace to the host namespace okay is this is this helpful is this making it easier to understand what what mininet is trying to do how it really works okay good so you uh, <coughs> why don't we just create host in uh root namespace we can create host in root namespace but we want to emulate a link as well right so we need to invoke some virtual eth pair to put a link in place and that's why we need to put them somewhere else is that answering your question okay what else any other questions Okay so this uh, brings us to the end of our discussion on network virtualization i hope 
you folks you know enjoyed learning about virtual network virtualization and if you have any questions you know just reach out to me uh, we won't have a class on wednesday uh, i mean we will have class but i will not be teaching so uh, rohan uh, who's the lead ta he'll be uh, you know like taking the lecture on wednesday and he will be you know like continuing to deep dive deeper into this p4 world right so you basically learned a very basic p4 program how to write it i think like he'll basically you know like give you a bit more exposure to the tools that you can use to write p4 programs right so how how do you set up your environment how do you write the p4 programs maybe give you a bit more context on different pieces in the in that world and also he will expose you to the p4 program that is part of assignment 1 right so in assignment 1 we expect you to work on a specific you know like a specific set of match action tables like you know how do you specify those match action tables like you know we we don't really want you to do super complicated stuff as part of this assignment 1 but then there is a lot of context around how exactly that p4 program is working right so that is our goal uh, in the next lecture that we will try to explain to you that you know what is the what is the bigger picture for this assignment 1 uh, what pieces are missing and what pieces are already there but you know the pieces that are already there what is the logical meaning of that like you know why are they there right so i think like that will give you a better context like better sense of how exactly uh, or what what other things that we are but that we have in a p4 program and that will prepare you well to you know complete the assignment one okay so but again i think you know like if you have any confusions questions just reach out to us and if you have any challenges understanding the p4 part you know let us know we can we can help or try to help you as much as possible okay thank you all right talk to you folks later then